2018, it is going to be an awesome year. And the simple fact that you are here today, bundled up, <laughs> as I can see, is testament to you made it. You made it through 2017. Right, right. Some of you are glad that 2017 is in the rearview mirror. Yes, I heard that. Others are like, hey, 2017 was great, man. Let's see what God's got in store for us for 2018. You know, because you survived. You made it through Christmas. You made it through all those traditions. You made it through all the visits with in-laws, right, and outlaws and all kinds of laws. And, 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 and you made it through, through all the football games. You made, you made it through all, all the stress and all the drama. In the words of the wise, immortal Buddy the Elf, congratulations, you did it. You did it. It is so, so exciting that you made it through this year. I love New Year's because they allow us to jettison the past, and they give us a fresh start, a chance for new beginnings. And one of the things I noticed as I was researching this, this, this start is how our traditions stress us out. And how sometimes, it, we don't even mean it, but we load this pressure on ourselves. We start, mm, we start adding stuff in, we need to do that, we need to do this. We have a, a list and we go through the, the whole thing and then you add the family and the shopping and all these things. And did you know that there are more people affected by heart-related issues during the holidays than any other time of year? It's true. It's true. So you, you literally, you made it. You didn't die. You're here. In fact, I love how Dr. Jeremiah put it. He said, sometimes we got to put our tradition in remission to avoid the mortician. <laughs> Man, that's good stuff. I like that. That is so true. One of the things I love about the New Year's is it's a chance to feel new. It's a chance to start over, a chance to reboot, a chance to, to say, you know what, I'm going to go with a new beginning this year, resolutions, and I resolve to do this and reflect on ways to improve. Now, we talked about New Year's resolutions, and, and I don't do a whole lot of those because, well, because the stats say they don't last. Let me just ask you this. How many people do you think keep New Year's resolutions? What percentage do you think? You think it's like 75%? No, no, no. 50%? 27.2%? Eight. <laughs> Eight percent. According to Forbes magazine, 8% keep their New Year's resolutions. I won't ask how many of that is in here, but if it's not you, ain't nobody else on the road kept that New Year's resolution. You can just look at your neighbor and go, gotcha. New Year's resolutions often fail. And a lot of times we look back and we go, man, I wanted to hit this goal. I wanted to lose weight here. I wanted to be healthier here. And sometimes, and, and those are great goals, and we all should strive for healthy. But sometimes I think we overlook the obvious, our spiritual health. So today we're going to do an inventory. We're going to do a quick checkup. There's a pastor named Stephen Hill who got together with his team and his staff, and they brainstormed incredible questions to help people do a spiritual checkup. And they came up with 50 questions. So for the next four hours, we're going to go through those 50 questions. No, don't worry. We, we whittled it down to the top 10. It's only going to take about two minutes. Now, here's, here's the beautiful part. You do not have to answer these out loud, okay? So sit back, relax. This is, there's, no, there's no grade on this. It's just between you and the Lord. Okay, deal? Deal? Do I have permission to ask some pointed questions if you don't have to answer them out loud? Not if you're with me. Yes? Yes? Okay. A couple of you shaking your head. No? Okay. All right. That's fine. Just sit there. Ten questions just to get us thinking today about our spiritual health. Question number one. Do you have a growing awareness of God's presence in your life? Do you have a growing awareness of God's presence in your life? Question two, are you increasingly aware of any sin in your life? Wow, man, we're starting with those already. That's just the second question. When you read God's word, is it a mirror to, you, to your soul? Are you aware of any sin in your life? You know, if you're not perfect, then occasionally there should be something that pops up on that radar, right? That's okay to say yes to that. Question three leads right into it. Is God's word challenging you? Is God's word challenging? Is there something in God's word that, if you're honest, you're wrestling with? Or maybe something you're struggling with? That's okay. That's okay, man. We, we struggle. Or maybe there's something you don't even understand. Is there something in God's word that's challenging you? Okay. Got your answer? Question four. Are you pursuing God's plan for your life or your plan for your life and how you fit into the kingdom for 2018? Number five. 
and I wish I didn't have to ask this one. I'm going to give you a pass on this. Are you growing in love for those who are difficult to love? I can feel that. Yeah, right? That's uncomfortable. Are you growing in love for those who are difficult for you to love? Oh, man, that's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? Number six, is there any discipline to your spiritual growth? Is there any discipline to your spiritual growth? Or is it kind of shoot from the hip, kind of haphazard? You know, I might do that. Are you more disciplined in other areas in your life than you are your spiritual life? Are you more disciplined with your budget? Being disciplined in your budget is awesome. But does it outrank? Are you more disciplined with protecting your hobby time? Hobbies are awesome. You need them. But is it first? Are you more disciplined with your fitness regimen than you are your spiritual life? Fitness is awesome. I mean, we need to be doing that. Y'all need to be coming to refit Monday nights and Saturdays. It's awesome. It, 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 will, it will help your cardio and your life and your stress. But there is a proper order here that we're going to look that the Apostle Paul talks about. And it is incredible. Is your spiritual life haphazard or is there discipline to it? Number seven, how actively are you involved and invested in God's local church? How actively are you involved and invested? Time, treasure, talents in God's local church. Number eight, you're almost there. You can breathe again. Is your lifestyle noticeably different than your peers who don't know Jesus? Man, that's a big one. That's a sermon right there. Go, go throughout your day. Is your lifestyle different than your peers, your coworkers, your friends who don't know Jesus? Because it probably should be. Number nine, these, these last two are good. These are easy. You don't have to frown at me. Here we go. Number nine. Is your relationship with God a source of delight? I know almost everybody in this room, and I'd say a lot of this, your answer is yes. That's awesome. And number 10, do you live with an increasing gratitude because of what God has done for you? Do you walk with that attitude of gratitude? Is it visible on your face? Some of us are saved, man, to the core, but we just forgot to notify our face. <laughs> right? If you're saved, it's okay to notify your face. It's okay to walk into a room and, and, and show joy. I didn't say happiness. Remember, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Two different things. Not what depends on happenstance, not because you're having a good day, but because you have an unspeakable joy just beneath the surface, brimming that constant grin. Those are 10 awesome questions. And if you think that's awesome, wait till you see what the Apostle Paul has for us today. Today is the perfect morning for self-evaluation. I'm going to set the context for what we're about to read here. It's going to be in Philippians chapter 3. Go ahead and open your Bibles there, but don't read it. Pull up your favorite Bible app. In fact, today I'm going to be reading from the CSB translation, the Christian Standard, okay? Uh, it's a great translation, very readable, but incredibly accurate. So if you follow along and that helps you to match my translation, the CSB is what I've chosen. And let me welcome those online. It's great to have you with us if you can't be here today. So Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he's basically writing a love letter, and it's it's, you, it's evident on every page. It's dripping for his people. He feels so awesome about his church, but there's some things he's really concerned about. And he's in jail. He's in prison. He's in chains as he's writing this. And he's saying, guys, I, I want to warn you to watch out for evil workers. Okay? Don't put confidence in the flesh. Your flesh will fail you. That means you're earning your, your way to heaven. It's not about that. It is through faith in Christ. And Paul is so adamant here. He goes on and he says, listen, there are some people around you, and I know them and you know them, that, that are putting confidence in their flesh and in their resume. And he says, if anyone has a chance to, to boast about their resume, it's me. Paul says this. Paul says, you think, you think you are qualified? Check this out. And he rolls out his resume and he lists these things. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That means my parents knew the Hebrew scriptures. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was from the nation of Israel. You think that's not good enough? I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Top that. Then he goes on to say, I was regarding the law a Pharisee. A Pharisee. You don't get it. You know what that word means? It means separate. I'm so good, I'm above you. I am separate from you, and I don't mind letting people know it. He was incredible with that. Regarding zeal, he says, I persecuted the church. Regarding righteousness, I was blameless. That's a big statement. So Paul opens up with his resume, and he starts work, you know, just saying, hey, you think you're confident in the flesh? Check this out. And then he does something you didn't expect. 
He lists this beautiful resume, and then right there in the next verse, boom, he tears it up. He tears it up and throws it away and says, it's not worth anything to me anymore when compared to seeking Christ and his righteousness. He goes on to actually compare it to some things. He says, everything that was a gain to me, I consider it a loss because of Christ. Moreover, he goes on to say, I consider everything a loss now in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things, and he's happy about it. In fact, he goes on to say, I compare everything I gained, everything I once loved, I compare it to something so despicable, I'm uncomfortable even saying it today from the pulpit. In fact, I'm not even going to use the word. I'm just going to use an emoji. I consider all things this. Happy chocolate ice cream. Seriously. He says, that if you go back, I just read the Greek word just again this morning, just to verify. He said, I compare everything that I valued, everything that I look up to, everything that made me who I am, I consider it animal fertilizer. He actually uses the word and I won't use that word, but that's what he does. He says, it is filthy to me. It is rubbish. It is a chocolate swirl ice cream. It is so bad. I don't even want to talk about it. It is so wicked. I just, I consider it totally, totally almost a shame to me. That is how he does. So then he goes on. He says these beautiful things leading up to the verses that we're going to read. He says, my goal is to know him. And you're like, yeah, Paul, I'm with you. My goal is to know the power of his resurrection. You're like, yeah, Paul, I'm with you. I want to know his fellowship. Yeah, but I want to know his fellowship of his sufferings. And that's where some of us put our arms down and say, wait, what? I was with you with the fellowship and the resurrection and all the good stuff, but and then he goes on, as if, as if people weren't quite sure where he was going. He says, I want to be conformed to his death. What? <laughs> this was a man who had his priorities right. What an amazing testimony. He had it all, and he wadded it up and counted it as manure. And then he comes and says, not only that, but it is all about him. I want to be conformed to him. I want to, I want to suffer with him. I want to be conformed to his death. Is, is that something we hear today? Especially in the blessed American church? This is incredible. He says, but hey, and I love his humility. He says, listen, I haven't already reached the goal. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I have been taken hold of by Jesus. Wow. And that's the context of what we're about to read in these next verses. Read on. He says, brothers and sisters, verse 13, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, don't forget that, okay? One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And I love this little postscript he adds. It's almost like, and if you think differently, that's okay. God's going to fix that for you. <laughs> I love it. I see two sides to everything. My side that's right and yours is that's wrong. God will fix it. If you think differently, you, you, God, will, God will clean that up for you. But he has every right to think that. He knows Christ. This is Paul's prescription for us to how to keep life in proper focus for 2018. It is full of so much deep stuff. Focus. I love that word. That single word is so powerful. It is the key to success for us walking after Christ, for us following him. It is at the heart of his message to the Philippians. Notice that one thing he says, this one thing I do. This one thing. I love that. Y'all remember this movie about 20 years ago where Billy Crystal's asking Curly, what's the meaning of life? What is it? What is it? And, and the guy on the left is just about to answer. He says, it's the one thing. And he says it with that raspy whisper that only Jack Palance can say it. He says, it's one thing. And Billy leans in. Yes. And he never gets around to telling him the one thing. In fact, I think he dies before he gets to tell him the thing. And it's like, come on. That one, th what's the one thing, Curly? What's the one thing? That one thing. I love that. Keep the main thing, the main thing. That is the core advice that Paul is about to share with us. Do you want your 2018 to be better than your 2017? Keep the main thing, the main thing. Focus on the one thing. The great O.S. Hawkins said this. He said, the key element to our spiritual growth is our ability to obtain and maintain focus. 
focus in the Christian life. That's it. That is the key to our spiritual growth. Not only to obtain it, but to maintain it, to keep it going, to keep your focus. When everything is pulling at you all day long at work, your buddies, people having all kinds of different agendas for your life. Don't have a plan for your life? Don't worry. Somebody will give you one. <laughs> right? They, everybody loves to have an opinion about what you need to be doing. Keep that amazing focus. I love this quote. It is so powerful. Focus will lead us to do four things as we look at, we'll walk through these scriptures. The first thing I notice when I read this, focus will put our priorities in order. Paul says this. He says, this one thing I do. Did you catch that? Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, these 10 things I do. I wake up every morning and I go down my list. Do, 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 these 10 things. He didn't even say these five things. Or even two. He said this one thing I do. Focus helps us put our priorities in order. First, you, you, you define your goal. And then your goal begins to define you. And that's beautiful. You should write that down. That's not even one of my notes. First, you define your goal. And guess what? Your goal soon begins to define you. And it is a powerful thing when Christ is the center of your goal. When you are looking and saying, God, this one thing I do, I want to serve you. And I love with humility, Paul goes on to say, listen, guys, I haven't taken hold of this yet. I haven't apprehended it. I've not arrived. I'm not even pretending I have, but I am pressing on towards my goal. This is my one drive in life. That phrase that he uses, this is so good. It literally means to lay hold of or pull somebody down. The analogy is that just like a modern day football player. Let me just put one up. Just pick one at random, Ryan. Just throw one up there, and we'll... we'll... What? What? Sorry, too soon? Okay, all right. This is, believe me, I had another one. I had it reversed about halftime, that I was going to show this, and I was gonna, it was going to be the other way around, just so you know I'm, I'm humble about this, too. This is the beautiful illustration where the, the person is laying hold of and saying, I have you in my sights, and I'm not letting go of my goal until it is in my grasp. Now when you read that passage, does that stand out a little bit to you? I have you in my grasp. I am going to pursue you. I am going to press on towards this. The Greek says, I am going to lay hold of, to pull down to the ground. Like he's saying, you are not getting away from me in 2018. I have my goals. And Satan, get behind me. I have my goal in front of me. I will not rest until I do this one thing. This is my highest priority. The next thing we see from Paul's scriptures is focus will give us a forward look. Focus gives us a forward look, and this is a beautiful thing because, let's be honest, too many people spend time looking around, or worse, looking behind. You know some people, maybe it's you, where there has been something in your past that is always in your rearview mirror. You know what I'm talking about? Whether it's a, a scar or some tragedy, and you struggle to get past it. You are still doing your best to drive forward, but all you want to do is look in the rearview mirror while you're driving down the road. That's a scary way to drive. We have a few of those drivers in Apex. Yeah. Oh, well, you've seen them. Man, some people don't need to have licenses. Sorry, that's free. That's not in my sermon. This, this, is, this is the whole admonition Paul is saying. Paul says, look at it, forgetting what is behind. His focus allows him to do something beautiful. He, he possesses, this is going to sound like an oxymoron, he actually possesses a wise forgetfulness. Isn't that cool? A wise forgetfulness. It sounds kind of strange. How do you grab something that you're going to forget? He possesses this wise forgetfulness where he acknowledges the past, but he doesn't dwell on it. It doesn't define him. He's done with that. Learn from the mistakes and move on. It is a beautiful thing. He, he says, I liken it to, this, uh, to the movies. When you go and you see a movie and the hero is about to get away and win the, win the game, win the movie, whatever it is, or the heroine, and they're running and they've vanquished evil and then for some unexplained reason they stop and they look back. <laughs> you know, Or they're being chased by the bad guy with the hockey mask or something and it's like, oh, let me stop and look back. No! What are you thinking? Looking back always slows you down. Amen? Man, makes me want to pull my hair out. Well, I guess I've done that. It, it makes me just want to throw popcorn at the screen and go, why are you stopping to turn around? You had it made. Go forward. The door is right there. 
I'm going to stop and look around one more time. No, don't do that. Paul is saying, forget what is behind. Don't look back. It slows you down. And when the year we're leaving behind is filled with regret and failure, it is so tempting, so easy to look back. And what do we do? We linger in it. And we marinate in it. Paul says, oh, man, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. It, it does you no good. Jettison the past. Bury it. Give it a proper funeral. Play taps and move on from your bad decision. Or move on from that tragedy. Or move on. You dragging that around is not helping you live for your future. Paul said, you want a forward look? Forget what is past. Pursue that one thing. Failures and regrets can become our focus. And if we look backwards, y'all, it can define us. And you know as well as I do, there are people we come in contact with that are so hurt, they just look like failure and bad things have defined their entire countenance. And that's not a positive image we want to represent for Christ. We say God has healed us and God is healing us and moving on, yet we, our body language says something different. Or our words we use are we're so dour, we're so down and out, and we wonder why nobody wants to be and have what we have. <laughs> Man goes back to my opening line. If you're saved, <laughs> notify your face. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Satan would love nothing more than for us to get caught in a web looking in our past. He would love nothing more than to have us mired down in some kind of cargo net web that holds us from going forward. But God has something in front of us. Look at Peter. Peter had this horrible time where he denied Christ. Not once. Not twice. Three times. And God restored him. and He became the rock of the church. Joseph had it all, went to having nothing. Family hated him, tried to kill him, went and served, had slavery, had all kinds of horrible betrayal and lost his family. He goes on to serve God in a powerful way with passion and purpose. Two awesome examples. Regardless of what the past has held for you, Paul is saying, look forward to God. Jettison that past. Say, today is my day. I am done with my past. I am done dragging around this ball and chain. I am leaving it at the altar. And today I'm going to give you a chance to do just that. Where you say, I am done. I am nailing this to the cross. I am done. Lord, I am turning my eyes towards you. And I am going to trust your amazing redemptive power for forward living. That's a powerful thing. When the church submits in humility to God and say, I can't do it. I'm done with this. I want a new beginning. And you can do that. Jettison the past. Surrender it. When we do that, we focus like that. Not only does that help us see our glass half full instead of half empty, it gives us that forward look. Look what else Paul says. Read on. He says, Paul goes on to say, I am reaching forward to what is ahead. Do you know what the Greek here implies? It is this idea that he is straining forward for a baton. Elias is a runner. And, and there was a time he let me borrow a baton. The idea, I researched, this is, this is even deeper than I thought it was. It's as if you're running to hand the baton off to the next guy, but get this, the next guy won't take it. The next guy is constantly running and getting a little bit further and further away from you so that you have to strain and you don't let up your pace. <laughs> Why? Because when we hand off the baton, what's our natural inclination? <sighs> Woo, I did it. <laughs> I'm just going to sit down right here and rest on my laurels. Paul didn't do that. This is, this is incredible. He said, I am never going to rest. I am going to strain. I'm going to press on running for that prize, but I know I'll never attain it in this life, but that's going to be my motivating factor. I am going to go, and I'm not going to give up. Man, that's powerful. This guy had every reason to rest on his laurels, every reason to rest on his credentials, right? You heard his resume. He could have said, that's good. Hey, you know what? Luke, it's yours now. Because Luke, by the way, was the pastor of this church for six years at Church of Philippi. I could sit over here. Luke's got it, man. He's younger. He's good. I'm just going to sit down for a day or a week or a month or a year. And before we know it, we've sidelined ourselves. And we've said, I've done that. I've done my, I've served in the nursery. <laughs> Whoa, did I say that out loud? I've I've, I've been in the tech booth before. I don't want to do that again. I'm tired. I'll hand that off. I put out signs in the five-degree weather and flags. And I've led people to the Lord. I've led enough. I'm, I'm just going to chill. 
I'm just going to, Paul could have done that and he didn't. He says, I am reaching forward, which leads us to the next point. He says, focus will set us for that second mile. It'll set us up to run that second mile. Focus is the passion that will fuel you. Focus is that, that thing that plants inside us a desire to do what's required, but then some. See, this is where Christians, this is where you and I, I hope it's just us in here today, I think so. This is where you and I should be different from those who don't know Jesus. We should be doing what's expected and what's required, and then some. You know what I'm saying? Not if you're with me. Yeah, yeah, okay, eight people are with me, awesome. Thank you. In every area, when we're at the restaurant, and you see that server getting chewed out, because, yeah, they're blowing it. They're messing up stuff. And everything in you says, they didn't earn any tip. I'm going to leave two cents just to let them know I didn't forget. And then they see that. Follow me to Potter's hand shirt that you're wearing. <laughs> oh, man. And we get a reputation for being the stingiest, chintziest people on the planet. We should be known for lavish love and for amazing generosity. And Paul is saying, y'all you got to go the second mile. He uses the words, I press. You know what that means? That carries with it the endeavor of an of, uh, avid hunter who is starving, who is desperately trying to find his prey. And he's, he's looking, and he knows if he doesn't get something today, it's over. And he's got his bow drawn back, and he is, he is pursuing his prey. I will press on through the thickets, through the weeds, and I will find my goal. That is what he's saying here. Wow. Guess what his one thing was? Living for Christ. How about you? How about me? You want your 2018 to be different than your 2017? You want to be better? Are you ready to take the next step in your spiritual faith? Man, he pursues one thing. It was his defining moment. It's important to know what it is that's your highest priority because the next thing we see is that focus lets us know where we're going. It lets us know what road we're on. It lets us know the path that we're supposed to be taking. If we don't have a goal in mind, you will hit it every time. <laughs> you will miss it all the time. Therefore, nothing will be your goal. It's, it's like shooting an arrow, letting it land, and then running up to it and painting a bullseye around wherever it landed and going, nailed it. <laughs> well, yeah. That's, Paul says, you focus, you know where you're going. In fact, the word, when he uses pressing towards the goal, this is beautiful. The word translates from the Greek word skopos. You know where we get the word skopos from? Anybody recognize this? It's a scope. I asked one of my friends who was a hunter if I could borrow his scope. And I'm just glad it didn't come attached to a rifle because I wanted to point it at you here as we look through this. Nope, I had it wrong. <laughs> Nope, had it right the first time, actually. Okay, all right, there you are. Now you're close again. All right, so I can see Roy and Lee. You know what's inside this scope? Crosshairs. Crosshairs. And when I line that up, I can see everything I want, and guess what? I don't see anything I don't want to see. It is beautiful. This puts almost like a tunnel vision. Like if you took a, a paper towel roll when it's empty and you held it up to your eye, it blocks out everything except what is dead in front of you. And there are crosses. And I wish I could just give this to everybody so you could see this. This is, this is amazing, and it's parallel. What is in the crosshairs of your spiritual life right now? What is your main thing? What is your one thing, to quote Curly from City Slickers? What is your one thing? You see, there's an analogy that goes even deeper than this. When you have your scope and you have your crosshairs and you're looking for your target, if you were to get a bow and arrow back a thousand years ago when they were training their archers, they would literally set up their target, massive target, and they would be far enough away so that it was a challenge. And they would line it up and they would fire their arrow. And if it was far enough away that they weren't quite sure where it impacted, they had an assistant, how would you like this job, that camped out near the target. And he had a big bright flag. And if you missed the bullseye and you weren't sure just how close you came, he would hold up a flag, wave it, and guess what he would yell? Sin. What? You missed the bullseye. Sin. Do you know what that's, what, that's where we get the word sin? It means you missed the mark. Wow. 
sin. You missed the mark. You tried. You just missed. It happens. You missed the bullseye. You missed the mark. Sin. And they'd raise the flag and they would say that word. That is so profound. So here's my question for you. Here is my challenge. What is it in your life today that is distracting you, that is making you miss the mark? Think about it. What is it that is competing for your spiritual affections for Christ? That's a fancy way of saying, do you have any idols? What is it that's competing for your love for Christ? What is it that is stopping you from putting in proper perspective that focus in those crosshairs? What is it? What's making you miss the mark? What is making you lose focus? See, focus is your springboard for 2018. Focus is your passion base, your reservoir of energy, of fuel to chase down that mark, to pull down that linebacker, to say, I have you in my grasp and you will not get away. This is my goal and I am resolved. Man, I love Paul's passion. Focus helps us begin our task with the end in mind. So, very simply, what is your goal this year? What is your goal this year for your Christian faith? Is it to maintain the status quo? You could do that. Is it to take a step back and go backwards? Backslider. Or is it to take the next step? Say, you know what? I'm done. I'm done playing in the shallow, in the kiddie pool, when God has a whole ocean for me. choice is yours. What is it that you need to surrender to the Lord? What is it that you want to put in the crosshairs today? In just a moment, we're going to have a chance to do that. And maybe you got somebody on your mind that you want to intercede for. Do that today. Next week, we're actually going to hand out prayer cards for all the children by name so that we can pray over them. See Leanne if you want to participate in that. They're going to be listed by name and their age, and and we just want to encourage them and to come around them and, and to be praying for them. Maybe you want to get a jump on that. Maybe you have something that is not about anybody else. It's about you, and God has brought something to your mind right now that you want to put in the crosshairs. Be obedient. Let today be your new beginnings. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the privilege that we can have a new beginning with you, that we can lay our cares, our struggles, all the things that distract us, we can lay them at your throne right before you, and we can say, Lord, we we submit them to you. We are done being lukewarm, forgive us for anything in our life, God, that is a distraction to us that pulls us away from putting you center in our crosshairs. God, give us a holy focus. Help us to have that desire like Paul showed us where this one thing, God, we press on, we, we cling to it, we chase it, we want to pull it down. We won't let it get away. Lord, I thank you for your presence here today. You are here. I thank you for the conviction that you give to those who wear your name. For without that, Lord, that would just be a sign we don't know you. I thank you that you chastise us, that you bring us back. You also encourage us. God, may we be bolder in 2018. May we be stronger in our faith. May we love more fiercely those who are difficult to love. May people see a difference. May we point them to you as the reason for our difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.